Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. So first, and, I, and my talk is sort of in rough, roughly in two parts. The first part is sort of relatively conceptual. And the second part will be focused more on current market developments. So first, let me start out with the conceptual part. What do we mean by liquidity? Well, I think of the question of what we mean by liquidity is how easy is it to uh, trade an asset without having a big movement in price? If you can trade an asset without moving the price much, and especially if you can trade it in large quantity, we think of such an asset as being relatively liquid. Now, the liquidity of an asset can be influenced by a lot of factors, such as the payoff pattern of the instrument. So some assets um, where the payoff pattern is sort of in maybe too intricate or has too many little, little details in it, that can get in the way of liquidity. The trading mechanisms, mechanism that's used can influence liquidity. So for example, let's say you have a market where, you have, where you're allowed trading over all kinds of times in the day. Well, spreading out the trading may actually get in the way of liquidity. If, on the other hand, if you allow trading just once a day, that actually might bunch the liquidity together and might, might add, add to liquidity. Um, current market conditions, this clearly plays a role in liquidity. Right now, we think of our markets as being much less liquid than, let's say, we would have thought of our markets a year ago. Investors also can possess a lot of, a lot of funds and a lot of liquidity itself and potentially can transfer that to other investors through the trading process, and they can transfer this among instruments. So, it's not just that we think of the instruments as being liquid, but we think of investors as being liquid or illiquid, and the trading process kind of moves, moves that around through our marketplace. Um, one particular mo model, uh, uh, one particular intellectual framework or model um, that has been quite fashionable among, among uh, finance finance professors and indeed economists more broadly with respect to trading is a model that was developed by Pete Kyle who's currently at the University of Maryland called the Kyle model and basically this model focuses upon the costliness of trading a position of a given size. Um, what is, the, what is the, the price impact of trading a position of a certain size? In effect you can think of that as a measure of how deep is the market um, if you fix the size of the trade, we can think of that as sort of basically telling you what is the bid-ask spread uh, or sort of a scaled version of the bid-ask spread. One way to view this is that the liquidity costs of trading reflect, reflect uh, think of it as a statistical regression of the costs created by private information or what's sometimes called adverse selection. Imagine that you have a market maker. Um, in fact, you can think of me as the market maker since I'm standing on the floor and you can think of, you know, imagine this, because even you can almost think of this as, as almost a little bit of the geography of a futures pit. Um, and people maybe, although in this case, we're not all congregating in the center. Um, um, but, you know, imagine you've got some trader, you've got a market maker, and he's facing orders. And some of the orders are perhaps from informed investors, and some of the orders are from less not, not so informed investors. Well, this market maker would really like to trade with the uninformed investors because he's not concerned that he's going to be exploited by them, but he's very concerned he's going to be exploited by the informed. So he sets a spread kind of reflecting the composition of the folks he's, tra he's trading against based upon his beliefs about those folks. Um, and so the market maker, he's uncertain who he's trading against, but then he sets a spread, and then the agents decide how much they want to trade with him. Um, the, the extent, how, how wide he has to set the spread depends upon the extent to which the market maker perceives he's trading with informed investors versus trading with liqui li li liquidity traders. So the ex this extent of adverse selection is influenced by current market conditions. A spike in adverse selection, for example, above normal levels, can actually then lead liquidity to decline. Um, that is, if you've got relatively more private information, the liquidity traders can say, gee, I don't want to trade in this market. This is just too costly to deal with. But frankly, that, really, that, that can make the problem even worse. So, you, 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 so let's say you have a market where liquidity is temporarily, where um, there's relatively less liquidity temporarily. And then the, the, the folks who are relatively uninformed say, I don't want to trade in that environment. 
that's going to make the terms of trade even less favorable and is going to lead to kind of further, further decline in the market. And, and I think this idea is sort of potentially important in terms of interpreting what we're seeing in recent weeks. Because I, in some sense, the decline in liquidity that we've seen in recent weeks and recent months can be self-reinforcing. That's sort of the basic message that I sort of take away from this. Um, a couple of other frameworks that I, that, that I think are kind of illustrative of, of, these, of this sort of notions. So there's a, a classic e example of, of illiquidity is, is, in, is what's called the no-trade theorem, originally developed by Paul Milgram and, and Nancy Stokey um, at the time who, who were faculty members at Northwestern. Um, so what they, I, I think maybe the best way to sort of summarize this is, a, is, is, is using a, an, an analogy that was used by a discussant of, of, of their paper. And the discussant, um, uh, Milt Harris, who at the time was a faculty member here, s sort of the way he summarized this was he referred to the old Groucho Marx joke. Groucho Marx, it was once said, declared that he didn't want to be in any club whose standards were low enough such that he would qualify as a member. Because if the standards were low enough that he would qualify as a member, um, it wouldn't be a very desirable club to be in. Well, in some sense, that kind of logic is exactly at the heart of the idea of, of the no trade theorem. That if folks want to trade with you, you ought to be cautious about trading with them. Because if they want to trade with you, and they want to trade with you because they think they're better informed, maybe you shouldn't want to trade with them even if you thought you were better informed. That's sort of basically the idea of the no trade theorem. This, this sort of manifests itself as well in some classic work by, by George Akerlof, for which, in fact, he won the Nobel Prize a number of years ago. He developed a very clever model, in, in fact, published in 1970, of a used car market. And basically, Akerlof's story was the following. Imagine that you've got buyers and sellers of used cars. And the sellers know the quality, but the buyers don't. So the buyer, but the buyers do know the distribution of quality. So the buyers say, gee, I'm going to price the car based upon the average of what's going to be offered in the marketplace. But the sellers say, gee, I'm going to price the car, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, whether I'm going to trade the car at all depends upon what quality of car I have. If I've got a high quality car, then what do I do? I don't sell it. But if I've got a lemon, I sell it into the market. Well, think about then what emerges in the marketplace. Frankly, what emerges is just like what happens in our, in our real used car market. Um, uh, the cars that are offered are the lemons. People have good cars, they don't offer it into the market. Now, why don't they offer it into the market? Well, in part, they don't offer it because, of, because they perceive that the price is going to be pretty low because it's basically lemons that are coming in. Now, if you think about how people, if you step back and reflect upon the pattern of ownership of cars, one of the things that's very striking to me is that people tend to hold their cars for a long time. You know, you think about how, how heterogeneous income and wealth is in our, in our society and how heterogeneous preferences are, you, you, you might expect that people might be turning over their cars a little bit, that, that people might say, gee, I tend to like to have three or four-year-old cars, and that's what I want to pay for. And so when my car becomes five or six years old, I should, I, maybe I should turn it over and buy it. But the problem with that is it's not a very viable, it's a pretty costly strategy to try to implement. Because the problem is when you go sell your car, you get, pri you get a price like you had a lemon, and so you don't tend to want to do that. And so that really gets in the way of trade. There's a, a fair amount, there's actually very little, arguably, there's not anywhere near as much trading in our used car markets as there would be if quality was really verifiable in some, in some, in some, in some deeper way. So the sellers, in effect, the story is that the seller's private information about the used car he's selling overwhelms the, the potential gains from trade. But I think those potential gains from trade are very real. But the point is, what happens? You have low quality and low volume and low prices. And it's just sort of endemic to the structure of that information. Well, what is that? That's basically, I would say, an illiquid market. So you know, if I sort of step back and sort of make some, some connections between liquidity and trading volume, um, you know, part of what I think of as a liquid market is are there lots of buyers and sellers? In futures markets, for example, we often focus upon the volume or what's called the open interest, how much is the net, expo the net positions either long or short, as indicative of the liquidity in particular futures contracts. Uh, an alternative view is will a given trading volume move the price very much? That was sort of the view that Kyle took in his classic work. But another important tie between liquidity and volume is that expressed by Akerlof. Low volume, in fact, may actually be a measure of low quality 
um, um, and, 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 and low price, and that was really at the heart of Akerlof's analysis. So I think liquidity and volume are kind of wrapped up together, and, and maybe wrapped up in a number of these different ways, as I'm, as I'm suggesting. Now, I, th I tend to think that liquid assets are pretty valuable. And, and I think of liquid assets as being assets perhaps that turn over a lot. So that's like the opposite of the used cars. Um, uh, I think these are especially valuable um, because they, they have low trading costs. And I think of low trading costs as being one interpretation of what we mean either by a liquid asset or what we mean of, of an asset being of high quality. Um, when, when, when liquid, and of course, what happened this summer is that liquidity dried up. When liquidity dried up, what happened to asset values? They plummeted. Um, and I think that really kind of fits this story. Now, liquidity, I would argue, though, is especially valuable for assets that will be turned over frequently. For assets that aren't turned over frequently, liquidity, frankly, doesn't matter that much. Now, finance professors have sort of tried to grapple with some of these ideas. And, and one way... And one way in which they've done so is they've done some empirical work where they are able to kind of measure liquidity and then sort of see that it sort of shows up in helping to explain returns, or the way sort of financial economists would describe that is they say that liquidity is a, is a price factor. Now, I think of liquidity also as being self-fulfilling. And one way I would sort of describe that to you is liquidity attracts liquidity. And I think a kind of a nice clean example of this is what I'll call the benchmark bond puzzles. And these arise both in the US, but I think maybe even more in a more pronounced way in Japan. Um, there's this phenomenon of what's called the on-the-run bond in treasuries. So there's, there's one often in, in the treasury markets, both in Japan especially, and to some extent in the US, there's a particular bond that tends to attract a lot of the flow, a lot of the, the trading flows. That's called the on-the-run bond. To some degree, in, in Japan, the on-the-run bond is actually formally designated. In the U.S., it arises more by custom. But in, in both cases, basically, these on-the-run bonds are very attractive instruments for trading because they tend to have a lot of liquidity. Well, another sort of form of this is that the returns that you earn, that the prices of the on-the-run bonds are high because they have this other source of value. If I express high prices in terms of returns, saying a bond has a high price means it has a low prospective return. That's ignoring the liquidity benefit. So, um, but you can, so you have different bonds of roughly the same maturity, but slightly different maturities of somewhat different prices because one bond is very liquid and the other bond isn't. Um, and so the, what happens is then the liquidity attracts even more liquidity. Now, liquidity also, frankly, can dry up almost without apparent reason. Or, or it can also decline due to renewed concern about adverse selection. The issues of liquidity, I think, were, are, have arisen quite starkly in the last year or so. Um, uh, Bob Schiller, who, who's, now at, who's now at Yale and was one of, one of my graduate school teachers, has been pushing quite vigorously over the last couple of years to, for the futures markets and investors to be trading macroeconomic housing contracts. And Bob basically takes the view that one of the big risks in our economy is, are the prices of houses. And so he's basically designed some futures contracts to facilitate hedging that, that economic risk. Now, now, what's happened is, and I, and I know from conversations with Bob, he's been very frustrated about the relatively slow buildup of open interest and volume in these instruments. Um, and you know, I think that you know, and I think that points to the, the difficulty often of of attracting and sustaining liquidity. And in fact, I think you know, it can be hard to do that. In fact, it, in my mind, it kind of raises a question: you know, in what context might it actually even be valuable to subsidize? You know, suppose you're you're trying to create some product. You know, if you really wanted the product to be liquid, you know, it may even make sense to try to figure out ways to subsidize trading to build up interest and and you know, but you can only do that, of course, if there's enough financial rents to you at the back at the back, at the back end. Um, the issue of liquidity and contract design, I think, arises in some interesting ways. Um, a couple of, uh, of academic studies in the early 1990s, one by Subramanian and another by Gorton and Panacci, highlighted the nature of liquidity on a futures contract versus individual stocks. And basically what they argued is that if you trade an aggregate basket like a futures, but not just a futures, it could be an index contract as well, that potentially the private information about value was going to be pretty limited. 
compared to trading an individual stock. And so as a result, the, the basket tra trading should potentially be a lot deeper and a lot more liquid. Um, and, and this can potentially have a lot of influence on what folks want to trade. And so a lot of institutional investors, to the extent that they're trying to adjust their overall exposures, they don't do that by trading stock at a time. They trade baskets. And part of the reason is then when they, can, when they go to Wall Street to, to trade and get a counterparty, the, the costs of doing the trade are much less if they're bundling, bundling lots of stuff together because the counterparty isn't concerned that there's lots of private information being expressed on the other side. So you wind up with a lot that here, just by basically changing the nature of the contract, by making it about a basket as opposed to an individual stock, you wind up with a lot deeper market. But not only does the contract design influence the extent of liquidity, but so does the, so do, so do, so does the market design. The market design, um, for example, if we have a, what's called a call auction, like a one-shot trading situation, that can potentially lead to a pretty deep market compared to continuous trading where trading is spread out. On the other hand, the, so here I've argued that the market design can influence liquidity. But let me be clear, it can also work the other way. Liquidity can influence the market design. And I have a sort of a simple personal vignette to kind of try to hone in on that. Um, so I, I, I was sort of largely, resp I was, I was, I, I, um, my family lived in a, in a condominium uh, in the city for, um, from 1980 to 1993 until we bought a house in Squirrel Hill. Um, and, and so I, at some point I was responsible for buying a condo. And then in 1993 I was responsible for selling a condo. And then later on, coincidentally, I was responsible for selling the condo of, an, of, an, of another family member in the same building a number of, a number of years later. So basically, I was involved in three condo transactions here in a, in a high-rise ri high building with 80 units um, and with basically just only eight different layouts. Um, um, so, so how did those transactions work out? Well, it turns out in none of the three transactions was a broker involved. When we bought our unit, we heard about it because somebody put a, a the, the, the owner Put a, put a little announcement on the bulletin board downstairs. And we heard about it that way when visiting, when, when vi visiting folks we knew in the building. Um, when we sold our unit, we didn't even quite get around to putting the announcement out because people knew we were going to be selling because we had, we, we had, bought, we had bought the house uh, I'm now in, in Squirrel Hill and we're renovating it and people knew that. And so we had a, we had a list of half a dozen and so at the point that we were ready to start to talk to people, we started to talk to them. We had a list of half a dozen people. And, and basically, we never even got around to putting the notice downstairs, which is probably a mistake, because maybe it could create a little bit more competition. But, but basically, we were in a liquid market. There were, there were, in effect, a lot of close substitutes. Namely, the, the other units in the same stack had exactly the same layout. So there was sort of a lot of aggregation of demand. So in, 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 in the other case where, where we had the property to sell, well, the sale, the sale didn't go quite as quickly, but we still felt, so we exhausted our initial list of, of buyers and we put the notice downstairs and we, at some point we kind of exhausted uh, what we had and we thought, but okay, but we're still in a relatively liquid market. So rather, rather than um, hiring the broker right away, we thought, well, we should still keep trying to sell it a little bit. Let's see what happens. So we started running ads. And about $1,000 later, in terms of the ads, um, um, we sold the unit. Um, so, you know, that, that was a fraction of a percent. That, you know, that was still less than half of a percent um, as compared to the broker's charge, which would have been probably six or seven, somewhere between, let's say, five and seven percent. By the way, ironically, we actually sold, um, we sold, the, we sold the unit that turned out to somebody that we kind of knew. Um, um, but didn't know that they were in the market for the unit, and they saw, in fact, they saw our ad in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Um, so the ad did play a role. Um, but the point of my story is that the optimal mechanism for selling depends in part upon the type of asset. Whereas with idiosyncratic houses, uh, it wouldn't even occur to me to try to sell it without a broker, because the search issues and the matching issues are just too fundamental. That as certain types of properties are so attractive um, that they don't need a broker. Well, think about it. That then has implications for what those properties are worth. 
Arguably, they're worth more precisely because they, they don't need a broker. In fact, I made this observation when I was a, at a, on a panel at a, at a conference uh, two months ago, and Pete Connell was one of the other participants there, and he, he had kind of a clever way to kind of re, restate what I, what I just said. He said, oh, what that means is that when they, te when they tell you in the ad that it's a one-of-a-kind property, you should view that as actually not attractive um, because the one-of-a-kind property gets in the way of, of, it, of it, in fact, being, being, being liquid, which I thought was sort of an interesting sort of take on exactly this point. All right, so that's, the, that's kind of the first half of my, of my presentation. So that, that was sort of pretty conceptual. Now I want to sort of turn more to the current market uh, context and sort of make some observation, maybe focus more on sort of observations about where, where we are and what the issues are. So let me start by talking a little bit about systemic risk, because uh, there's a lot of sort of talk about this in the, in the broader economy these days. Uh, basically, systemic risk refers to the potential for correlated defaults across the economy. Um, and indeed, I, I think the, the nature of the systemic risks that our economy faces are, are real and, and maybe bigger than we sort of previously thought them to be. And, and, and what are some of the reasons for this? Well, first, many hedge fund investors are often on the same side of a position. Well, why is that? Well, and they do, because th they do things that are often like long the credit spread. So they're often betting, they're often investing in not so good credits and hedging by selling Good credit, good credit, so treasuries. They're often financing through treasuries and then being along the credit spread. Now, why is that? Well, somehow they feel that they're going to be able to make economic profits from doing so. And maybe another way to view this is that all the, a lot of these hedge fund investors, they kind of come in with the same, the same type of training, not, not, not narrowly defined, but broadly defined. They come in with the same training. They come in with the same kind of expertises and tools. Um, and so guess what? If you come in with similar training and expertises and tools, you're going to see the issues in the same way. So maybe it's not that surprising that the hedge fund investors are going to tend to be on the same side of a position. Um, there's also some interesting kind of external effects across investors. Recently, some of the hedge fund funds I thought had the audacity to blame their peers for following similar strategies. And therefore, as a result, the, 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 a given hedge fund experienced big price impacts. So the argument here is basically the following. Some of the hedge funds were basically complaining that, that what they were doing was being either imitated by, or maybe they, on the other hand, maybe the imitation was the other way. But in particular, some of the hedge funds were doing the same thing as their peers. Well, the consequence of that then was when the hedge funds were decided to exit from a particular thing, the other hedge funds were exiting too, and the price impacts were really big. Um, and so this has been kind of a, a little bit of a complaint um, by some of the hedge fund uh, investors, well, in fact, those kind of big price moves are kind of suggestive of, of systemic risk or, or the potential for correlated defaults. Um, the bearing of risk, I think, also reflects a common incentive structure. A lot of the, if you think about the incentives that many of these hedge funds have, the way in which the incentives are structured, for example, this classic 2 and 20 contract, 2%, let's say a 2% or some other fixed fee, and then maybe 20% of the return over a certain threshold level, well, that's going to encourage the bearing of certain types of risks. Um, to the extent that there's similarity in the incentive contract across different parties, that potentially should, should then potentially encourage the particular types of bearing of risk. In fact, perhaps also the past Federal Reserve policies may, may facilitate this as well. My, 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 my distinguished colleague Alan Meltzer, for example, has argued quite strongly um, that perhaps the past actions of the Federal Reserve in the face of market turbulence have in effect led to moral hazard, have led the, the hedge funds, and he argued this I think quite, quite, you know, I think quite cl cleanly in a, in a piece in the Wall Street Journal on Saturday, September 15th. What, what, Al, what Alan argued is that, that the past Fed policies, to the extent that they kind of come in and ease credit in exactly the times that following risky really risky strategies would have been really problematic for you, in effect have the, have the effect of bailing out the investors who followed those risky strategies. And it, it kind of puts a, and in fact, it puts a floor under the strategies. In fact, to some extent, this floor actually got, I, I, I hadn't heard the term before, but this, this summer and fall, it in fact even got named after quite a distinguished uh, former chairman of the Federal Reserve. The newspapers started calling this the Greenspan put, um, uh, kind of, kind of viewing, the, the cre the, the viewing this as basically a floor uh, that former Chairman Greenspan had actually created. Well, let me sort of step back from that a bit 
But certainly, you know, if, if the market perceives that there's going to be that kind of downside protection, it actually can encourage bearing of risk in certain kind of ways and maybe, in fact, encourage you to bear risk exactly in similar ways to when the others bear risk because, because that's when you're going to get the bailout. So who holds the risk? Well, I think it's an interesting issue. A lot of the, the senior policymakers in Washington take a lot of comfort from, from the fact that the risks aren't being borne directly by the banks as much. So, for example, they look at last year at the liquidation of Amaranth, the big natural gas hedge fund, and they basically saw, okay, Amaranth lost a huge bundle of money, but no financial institutions went belly up. Okay, it's true, um, and they sort of viewed that sort of obviously with some favor. But, but in fact, a lot of the financing does come from banks and prime brokers. That's who finances the, the hedge funds. So... You know, whether, you know, the next time there's a kind of big meltdown of a hedge fund, whether, you know, whether we're going to be so lucky, you know, obviously that's sort of an open issue. The exposures certainly are less transparent when they're held by a hedge fund than when they're held by a bank. And you can see this by some of the surprises that we've witnessed over the last few weeks. I think the recent difficult, for example, some of our recent difficulties, if we go back earlier in time, earlier in the summer, the recent difficulties really started with high defaults and adjustable rate subprime loans. But interestingly, then they moved to better mortgages. They moved really, they migrated over, they got transmitted to the jumbo market. Um, that is, the, the problems don't stay confined necessarily to a particular sector. Now, so I think an, 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 another important aspect of systemic risk is who holds? Who holds the risks? So I think a big, a big feature here is counterparty risk. You often don't know who really is holding the risks, and we learned a lot about this over the last month. Folks really didn't know whether it was Merrill or whether it was, or, or, or which firms. You know, it turned out Merrill and Citigroup seem to be among the leaders in holding, this, in holding these exposures. Um, but it's kind of a little bit related to the lack of verifiable or reliable prices for the instruments. So you had relatively illiquid instruments. You had some pricing, pricing, pricing difficulties. Um, and you could see how changes in perhaps transparency and changes in adverse selection can potentially drive changes in liquidity. Now, of course, from the point of view of market participants, there's then a reluctance to sell instruments with the largest losses because they think they're not getting very favorable prices. So they tend to want to sell more liquid instruments. And this, happened, this is exactly what happened with long-term capital almost a decade ago. What long-term capital did was instead of selling the hard-to-sell stuff, of course, they sold the easier-to-sell stuff to scale back their book. Um, so the problems then spill from the less liquid stuff to the more liquid. So this is exactly how stuff migrates across assets. So the problems in the prime, so the problems then move from the subprime loans to the prime loans. This is why basically our, our jumbo loan market kind of dried up this, remarkably our jumbo loan market dried up this summer um, with the need to reduce leverage. So you have basically a credit crunch, and because of that credit crunch, uh, you have then the Federal Reserve trying to step in to try to, to try to ease the situation. But you can see you can get transmission of problems across markets, even potentially globally. So problems that started in our subprime mortgage markets wind up moving around the globe. Now, credit ratings themselves can be a source of systemic risk. Um, you know, here, in the subprime mortgage crisis, one of the remarkable things is that we didn't simply have some company's credit being mis mis mismarked by Moody's or Standard & Poor's. We had a whole class of assets being mismarked. Um, there, that is, and there's the scope for misvaluing a whole asset class rather than just an individual loan or some little idiosyncratic risk. Many market participants rely upon these, and so potentially this is a, this is a huge source of systemic risk. Um, I think regulatory coordination is, is an increasing source of, of, of concern. A lot of the strategies are global. A lot of the players are global. global. We're seeing now more consolidation of platforms around the world. Um, and, and as I've noted, systemic risk potentially spills across markets in our global economy. Now, of course, broader, broader risk sharing is good, I think. Um, it's certainly, if you think about, economists often criticize what's called the home country bias. The home country bias basically says that investors tend to invest in their home country. And economists sort of view that as bad because you're not really getting full risk sharing. You're not getting the benefit of, of, tr of trading to the, to the full degree possible. Now, so broader risk sharing, most economists would agree, is to the good. That produces, in some sense, optimal risk sharing. But in fact, with broader risk sharing, you've got exactly the sort of transmission of problems from one market to another. Now, the issue then arises, well, what's the regulatory response to some of these systemic risks? Well, our multinational, think of the following scenario. 
Suppose you've got a multinational financial institution, but suppose many of the customers are in one country and the regulatory authority is in another. And now the regulatory authority is thinking about a bailout. How is this bailout going to take place? Will the regulator in one country want to ship a bunch of money to the financial institution whose customers are largely in the other country for the money to go to the customers in the other country? Doesn't seem very plausible. So it seems like that, that would get in the way of a bailout. That may not be bad, by the way, but that would get in, will tend to get in the way of a bailout uh, because there's issues of who will pay. And, and in fact, I kind of alluded to, to this before, there are issues about whether interest rate cuts themselves are desirable uh, because it, they arguably bail out those who follow risky strategies. Um, I do think that the subprime turbulence that I've talked about illustrates that problems really aren't confined from, to one country or another, but can kind of spread naturally across markets. So finally, let me just talk very briefly about regulation in this sort of environment. Um, regulations are often oriented to specific types of markets or specific investors. Um, so for example, suppose our cash markets are much more heavily regulated than over-the-counter derivatives. And indeed, the cash markets are much more heavily regulated. And suppose mutual funds are much more heavily regulated than hedge funds. And indeed, they are. Um, so now imagine that we impose some new regs. And the new regs are perceived as burdensome. Um, what would you expect happen? Well, you'd expect that transactions would substitute toward the less regulated markets and the less regulated investors. You'd expect there to be a natural, in the face of burdensome regulation, you'd expect the market would respond to try to mitigate those costs, it would respond to move transactions away from the less regulated markets and, the, and, and move them toward, move them, you'd expect transactions would change to move them toward less regulated markets and less regulated investors. But, but this sort of substitution is in fact a challenge to the old model of regulation. The old model of regulation sort of assumed that you had a bunch of entities who were regulated and they couldn't escape the regulation. And so then the regulator can impose whatever crap they want to, um, uh, and, they, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they, you know, and the market has sort of limited its ability to respond. Well, it basically, if, if the market can simply say, oh, gee, I'm going to go through a, different, a slightly different form of transaction or go through a, a different player and evade the regulation, that's, in fact, exactly what you would expect would take place. Um, and, and increasingly, you know, when I've talked to senior people in hedge funds, they basically say from the fina purely financial perspective, it really doesn't matter with it, where an instrument trades. And so if there's a regulatory burden in one context, they're going to they're gonna work to work around it, basically. And in fact, you can think of this as sort of basically regulatory arbitrage, just as we try to arbitrage in other dimensions and minimize costs or maximize profit. So, so you ex expect parties would, would do with respect to regulation. Maybe a way to view this is that channeling transactions to uh, hedge funds can, in some contexts, reduce the transparency of, of, of the way in which, so you, so you substitute transactions, let's say, from more regulated form over to hedge funds, but in turn, that channeling can actually reduce the transparency of how risks are being allocated, which in turn can heighten the systemic risk problems, and so this is, I think, kind of a, a, a difficulty and a problem in our, in our society. So I've sort of talked long enough, um, so let me just open the floor, we have a couple of minutes remaining, and uh, so let me just open the floor for, for questions. Hedge funds and banks kind of like uh, you know, banks have shares of risk when they take positions against hedge funds. What happens when the banks own the hedge funds themselves? Vera Stern, the bank owns its own hedge funds. Is there some kind of conflict of interest there? Or? Okay, so let me, let me try to address that in a couple of ways. So, first of all, so part of what I was referring to directly was that sometimes that the banks are often financing the hedge funds. Okay, so the hedge fund maybe. They may, maybe they get some state pension plans and some other, insti uh, other institutions to put some money in, some equity money in. But then, they, then the hedge funds lever the money up. And the leverage, where does the leverage come from? Well, either it comes from, it comes from either prime brokers, um, basically brokerage firm, or it comes from banks. And so that, that's then a sense in which, the, now the banks aren't really focused upon the underlying risks associated with that because they think of it as not as equity, they think of it as debt. So, you know, they don't think of it as their as their stuff, but in fact, of course, when, when does the loan go bad? It goes bad basically when that, when that, sec, when those, when those, when that client is doing bad. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so that, that's sort of the scenario that I had in mind. And in particular, so what I was suggesting then is that some, some of these risks are still being borne by, the prime bro, by, by prime brokers and by banks, but it's sort of in a little bit more hidden form because it's now in the form of these loans 
Now, I think your question was sort of focused on a slightly different piece of this. So sometimes the hedge funds are explicitly owned by the big financial institutions. Um, the the Bear, Bear, Bear Stearns obviously had some problems with its hedge funds. Uh, Goldman actually had some, had, had some problems as well. Um, now, so first of all, a couple of observations. Um, first of all, Bear, Bear Stearns, neither Bear Stearns nor Goldman is really a bank. Um, so probably the, the, the banking regulators will take some comfort out of that. You know, certainly the collapse of a major, of a major firm wouldn't go unnoticed, although, you know, I, I would say sort of, bear, my sense is Bear Stearns is probably less, you know, probably less, probably less fundamental than, than, than Goldman. But obviously the collapse of a firm like that would have major repercussions throughout the economy. But it is also true that some securities firms in the past have gone under, and the economy has kind of worked through it. You know, you had Drexel Burnham go under. Uh, you had E.F. Hutton go under. So you've had securities firms go under. That's not without, that's certainly not, with, that's certainly not without um, precedent. Um, now, I, it, so, yeah. Right. Other questions? Uh, do you feel that the institutions that are holding these mortgages have sufficiently driven them uh, down to market value? Impossible for me to judge. Um, um, you know, what, what I will observe is that some of the write-offs were then followed by more write-offs a few weeks later. Now, some of that may be just in the process of gathering information, I guess I, I, would, I would acknowledge. But it obviously means that, you know, at a given point in time, you know, whether we're fully there, it may be an open issue. So I think I think it's it's very it's I think it's impossible for an outsider to be able to have have me, have meaningful insight about about that, or at least it's impossible for this outsider to to do that. Back to something you mentioned uh, closer to the beginning of your presentation about um, stock option backdating, particularly mm -hmm. in tech companies. I mean, I did some reading a few months ago. Apparently, within Apple, Steve Jobs got into some hot water over stock option backdating, and it was sort of swept under the rug after an internal investigation. So to what degree do you think that's still an issue with these kinds of companies today? Like this was only a few months ago, I think. To what degree do I think? Well, I mean, so certainly in some, you know, I, I don't want to comment on Apple. I certainly don't want to comment on Apple specifically, but, but I'll talk sort of generally. Um, I think it's clear that, you know, there's still a variety of open uh, you know, I think it's clear from from you know from statements over the over the last number of months um, from SEC enforcement officials that there's still there's still matters that are sort of being there's still matters certainly that are being there's still matters that are that are that are that are being worked through, but you know I I also think um, you know the you know you know we may be you know we may be toward it's hard to know but we may be toward the latter stages of the option backdating uh, uh, is, 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 issues. Um, you know, one thing about the backdating to keep in mind is that, by and large, the really bad behaviors stopped after 2002. So it's not that these are necessary; are prob these are probably not huge ongoing issues. Um, it's more now about the past, and obviously, increasingly, the distant past. Um, why did this become less of an issue starting in 2002? Because one of, I would argue, now the le the, the not very controversial aspects of Sarbanes-Oxley was to require timely filing. Basically, Sarbanes-Oxley required that this stuff be reported within two days. Um, and so the prior requirements allowed huge amount, allowed very long lags, and that, that, that really led to a lot, of, uh, a lot of flexibility, you know, and some would argue kind of a lot of sh shenanigans in what, in what was being reported. By the way, one of the things that I think is interesting, if you look back at the backdating stuff, is it's not the problem with backdating is it's not simply that people didn't do the paperwork on time. That's not the issue. The the issue is when you look at the patterns associated with when they didn't do the paperwork on time, the results tend to flow in, in particular directions. So you know there's a very strong you know it's clear that there was sort of a fair amount of opportunistic uh, beha be behavior in the in the uh, in in the in the in the in the backdating. And so back you know so the term backdating. You know, sometimes people interpret it sort of narrowly as saying, well, people didn't file their documents, didn't, didn't fill out the pieces of paper on time because maybe they had an awkward internal process. Well, if all it was was an awkward in internal process, you would expect that that would basically produce pretty neutral price patterns. 
And that's not at all what shows up in the data. Okay, well, any, any, any final question? Or? All right, well, thank you very much.